the test going. All right. We have entomologists in the room tonight. You can tell because there's a buzz. You get it? Uh, no, that's, those are my people. Those are my people. I'm a plant pathologist from Ohio State. So uh, glad to have you here. Anyway, welcome to the cold, wintry edition of City Council, Bexley City Council. Uh, here in Ohio, we never get too excited or optimistic when December passes with the, uh, the warmth because we know that the snow is coming. However, the great thing about living in Bexley is we know after a big snow, when we go out the next morning, the streets will be nice and ready for us as they were this week. Yes. So it was cold, but the streets are not too bad. And I thank each of you for making the drive here tonight. Get in here to city council. Good to see everybody back again. And I thank you for your service to our city. Mr. McPeak, can you uh, give us a roll call, please? Bible? Here. Klingler? Here. Lampke? Here. Marcelino? Here. Markham? Here. Robinson? Here. And Here. <laughs> please join us in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have a presentation here and I, I should turn it over to Council Member Robinson probably, right? Would you like to introduce our you guest? You certainly can. Um, and then shall I turn it over to Miss Elizabeth Elman, who some of you may know as, when you get up here, give me your title again, because I keep forgetting you change so often your responsibility to the city. So Elizabeth Elman, I'm gonna hand it right on over to her. Hi, I'm Elizabeth and I am the city's sustainability programs coordinator. Yeah. And on behalf of the sustainability department, I'm here this evening to introduce Rebecca Ness, vice chair of the environmental sustainability advisory committee. Rebecca is passionate about biodiversity and the natural world and has strong interest in supporting pollinators and ecosystem preservation. Rebecca revitalized the city's Love Your Alley program and building on that success is here to discuss another initiative, an integrated mosquito management plan. So without further ado, here is Rebecca Ness. Hi. Thanks for having us tonight. Can you all hear me? It's kind of high for me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. Um, is it bendy? Yeah, a, little, a little bendy, a little bendy. Okay. I'm Rebecca Ness. I've been a Bexley resident for about four and a half years now, and um, I'm serving as the lead on the Mosquito Task Force and as vice chair for Green Bexley. I spearheaded Love Your Alley, as Elizabeth just told you all. It, it's a Bexley initiative to transform our underutilized alleys into extended living space and a homegrown national park for biodiversity and to support all of our pollinators. And now I'm happy to let you know that I'm a business owner in Bexley. I relocated my acupuncture clinic to, to Bexley on Main Street, right by the Drexel Theater. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and as an acupuncturist, I recognize the strong correlation between the planet's health, planet's health and human health. And my aim is to support and care for both. Um, I'm really excited about this pilot program. It offers an opportunity to manage mosquitoes without hurting our pollinators or unnecessarily exposing our residents or pets to chemicals. Franklin County Public Health agrees that if we reach the point where spraying is required that the program's failed. So let's try something different. Dr. Mary Gardner and Dr. Megan Muti, both entomologists with OSU are here to present tonight. And Sarah Fink from Franklin County Public Health is here as well to answer any questions about the current mosquito program. So we're ready for the PowerPoint. And Megan, Megan, Dr. Megan Muti will get started for us. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? 
Excellent. Okay, so I'm Megan Muti. I'm um, in the entomology department at Ohio State, and I study mosquitoes, which we all hate because they suck our blood and they transmit diseases. So on the slide, you can see um, the image on the top is a female mosquito taking what we hate her for, sucking our blood, and she uses the protein from that blood to produce eggs, which is what the mosquito on the bottom is doing. She's laying her egg raft on the surface of the water. And then those eggs will hatch out into larvae that live in the water, and then they'll form the pupal phase, which is also aquatic, and then they'll emerge into the adult mosquitoes that we know and loathe. Um, so if we go to the next slide. And the reason the disease that we're most concerned about here in Ohio is West Nile virus. This is the most common mosquito-borne disease in the United States and in Ohio as well. It can cause major die-offs of birds. And particularly in the fall, mosquitoes transition from biting birds to biting people. And most of the people that get infected with West Nile virus are fortunately asymptomatic. They don't have um, any symptoms. And most of the people that do have symptoms experience pretty mild flu-like symptoms. However, one out of 150 people that show symptoms of West Nile virus um, can have very serious illness and can die. And 2018 was a particularly bad year for West Nile virus in Ohio, where there were 65 confirmed human cases and eight fatalities. Um, and then the very next year in 2019, there were only two cases, confirmed faces, and no, no mortalities, thankfully. So currently in, um, in Bexley, you guys are doing amazing and wonderful things. You're reminding residents on a regular basis to remove breeding habitats for mosquitoes. So any containers that collect water, um, which is wonderful and better than what Hilliard does where I live. Um, and then also Franklin County Public Health will treat catch basins, which are another source where mosquitoes can breed, um, and any other standing sources of water that can't be drained with larvicides. And then Franklin County Public Health will also collect mosquitoes, adult mosquitoes from two traps, one in North Bexley and one in South Bexley, and they'll have those tested for West Nile virus. And if mosquitoes from those traps test positive for West Nile virus, then they'll initiate a, a spray of an adulticide, which, which is a pesticide that kills the adult mosquitoes that are flying around. Now I'm going to hand it back over to Rebecca to talk about some of the concerns that she has as a Bexley resident about mosquito management. So some concerns that our community has about mosquitoes. Um, Bexley doesn't have much to do with um, eliminating nuisance or biting mosquitoes. And uh, so I think we can do a better job there. Um, and then as according to Franklin County Public Health and the, and the CDC, spraying adulticides is usually the least efficient mosquito control technique. Only 0.1% of pesticides on average actually reach, reaches the target pests. Some additional concerns is that pesticides can also harm beneficial insects, including bees and butterflies, which are really important for pollinating our flowers. Pollinators are critical to the ecosystems in Ohio. 85% of flowering plants and a third of worldwide food crops rely on pollinators. Monarchs are a national insect currently in jeopardy and also negatively impacted by pesticides. Lacewings, Lady beetles and spiders consume insect pests, like this ground beetle we see um, consuming a pest over there to the right on the bottom picture, or the middle picture, excuse me. And beetles and ants recycle nutrients and improve soil health. So as far as the timeline for developing the task force, in July, Green Bexley presented an integrative mosquito management plan to the Bexley Board of Health. At the meeting, the board voted unanimously to move forward to re-examine our mosquito management program alongside Franklin County Public Health. In August, Bexley's Mosquito Task Force was formed and the task force has met a couple times per month since August to develop a mosquito pilot program for the 2022 mosquito season. And that's what we'll present to you tonight. The members of the Bexley Mosquito Task Force in addition to myself and Dr. Muti and Dr. Gardner are Jen Robinson and Dr. Robert Shalowitz, who's a pediatric pediatric endocrinologist. He also serves on Green Bexley. Paula Krasnoff, who's a virologist and also serves on Green Bexley. Alex Meyer, an OSU grad student and a Bexley resident. Marty Linninger from OPHI, which is the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative. And um, doctors Megan Muti and doctors uh, Mary Gardner as well. Cool. Protect 
is from misbehaving our beneficial insects. Using a citywide experiment, we will determine if we can effectively reduce mosquitoes using traps and, and resident education um, and removing the need for pesticide applications. And I'm gonna hand the talk back now to Dr. Muti. Thank you. So I'll tell you a little bit about our project design. So we are going to have um, four different treatments and I'll be describing those in more detail in the upcoming slides. But we're gonna work with uh, members of the community to en enroll in one of these um, treatments. And then we're gonna establish five replicates. And each one of these replicates is going to consist of five properties that are either gonna be along a roadway shown on the bottom or that um, share an alleyway, um, which is shown on the upper image. So now on the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about our treatments. The first treatment is for um, best, best mosquito management practices. So this treatment is akin to those residents in Bexley who are currently opting out of Franklin County Public Health um, Mosquito Spraying Program. And this is serving as the control in our study because um, they're not doing any additional management apart from eliminating breeding habitat for mosquitoes. And we're going to provide training on best mosquito management practices for all of our participants because we do not want any extra mosquitoes in your beautiful city. Um, then the second treatment is where um, is the best mosquito management um, practices plus using traps. So in this scenario, we're going to use two different kinds of traps, um, 80 gravid 80 straps, which are shown on the bottom um, left hand side of the um, of the slide, which are nuisance, and um, the trap on the lower right. Um, those traps are used to collect the Culex mosquitoes, which transmit West Nile virus. And those contain just a tub full of really stinky water that has um, some kind of larvicide in, inside. So the female, in both cases, the female mosquitoes will be attracted to the traps. Um, in the case of the gravid 80 strap, the, mosquito, the female mosquitoes will get trapped in there and won't ever be able to lay their eggs. In the case of the Culex mosquito traps, the females will lay their eggs, but the eggs and the larvae will die out. Um, so that we can hopefully reduce the level of uh, both kinds of awful mosquitoes in Bexley. Then um, our third treatment is going to be the best practices um, plus the Franklin County Public Health Integrated Mosquito Management. And here again, residents are going to follow um, the best mosquito management pra practices and Franklin County Public Health will continue to spray their properties from the roadside if um, West Nile virus, if and when West Nile virus is detected in the area. And then in the fourth and final treatment, it's going to consist of um, the best mosquito management practices and then properties that are routinely sprayed with a barrier spray using commercial pesticide applicators. And so we need to know within all of these treatments, if this is working, are we, what is the level of mosquitoes generally in our control sites? And then are the traps reducing the number of mosquitoes and are they reducing them to the same extent that the sprays are? So to determine whether that's happening, we're gonna be using an, another kind of trap. These are called CDC light traps to just collect the um, adult mosquitoes that are flying around. The duration of the study um, is going to be from mid-June to mid-September. And um, during this time, we're going to collect mosquitoes from all of the different treatment sites twice a month. And we're going to publish all of the findings on our website, um, which Alex has just created, which is very exciting. And then um, at the conclusion of the study, we're going to survey the residents to get their perception of the levels of mosquitoes on their properties and their experiences in managing the traps. Um, and then ne next, Dr. Mary Gardner is going to be telling us about how we're going to manage or assess the, the impact of spraying as well as the mosquito traps on beneficial insects. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody. So as Rebecca mentioned earlier, one of the goals here by removing sprays from the community is to, hope to hopefully provide better habitat for beneficial insects. So how will we measure whether or not the traps versus spraying versus doing nothing influence beneficial insect habitat quality. To do this, we'll use a series of different traps to collect flying and canopy dwelling insects like lady beetles and bees. And these include yellow sticky card traps, which are a, pla uh, a paper card with an adhesive. The insects are attracted to the card, get stuck on it. We also use handheld vacuums to collect insects off vegetation. 
and pan traps, which mimic flowers that have a soapy water solution. To collect ground dwelling insects, we use pitfall traps, which are a uh, cup sunk at soil level, again with soapy water, and the insects will fall inside. We'll set these traps in all four of the treatments and we'll compare the number of species and the abundance of different species of beneficial insects among the different treatments to see whether or not we see more insects and a greater number of different types within the trap and control sites versus the sprayed treatments. And then on our next slide, we can also assess the direct effect of spray applications by using these drop cloths. So um, we would put these in all of the treatments just so we have a control. But what you would do is before a pesticide application, you put out these sheets under the vegetation canopy. After the spray application, you come back and remove any insects that have died and fallen on the sheet and then compare that mortality among the different treatments. And on the next slide. So what are our next steps as a group? So uh, based on feedback that we any of you would have or the community would provide to us uh, from our website, we'll be refining our study design protocol. We hope to begin our site recruitment in February to, to, to uh, collect these uh, individuals who are interested in being part of the sites that Megan described. Our team is submitting a grant proposal to the OSU uh, Infectious Disease Institute, and that's due in April that will fund much of the work that Megan described. Uh, we will begin our sampling in June, and that will run through mid-September, and that will be both for the mosquitoes and for the beneficial insect sampling. Then in the fall, we will identify all of the insects, finish up the mosquito counts, and analyze the data. And then we plan to be prepared to summarize and prevent uh, present our findings to you by late uh, 2022 or January 2023. I also want to point out that Megan and I are both state specialists with OSU Extension, so we do a lot of public programming. Um, we are here to help educate the community about all sorts of insect-related um, management. So this could include things like the specific goals and experimental design of this project uh, to get the word out about it. But we also speak about best management practices for mosquito management frequently, as well as how you can create habitat in your own yard to support beneficial insects. And we can do this in the library, like indoor settings, as well as outdoor workshops at farmers markets, parks, etc., like you see in the photo. Thank you very much. Um, all, all of us would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you for this great presentation. Uh, I'm uh, really familiar with Extension as I did my graduate work over in Cotman Hall. And it's great to see uh, these projects, you know, integrate into our community and uh, be helpful. Do we have any questions for our presenters, Mr. Marcelino? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, first, thank you so much for the work so far into this. Uh... Action to mosquitoes, and I know many people do. Um, the question is: Is there any other program like this that you guys have uh, studied in the past, and what was the uh, efficiency of that program? What were the results of using a more green approach to controlling mosquitoes? So we based the project off a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy, or not in the Proceedings of the National Academy, Scientific Reports, um, which is uh, a journal published by the um, National Academy. And this was a study done in the Baltimore area, and they were able to effectively trap out mosquitoes using traps set up in block groups. And that's how we got the idea in the first place. Uh, also, trappings have been done in several other cities. And I think we have a slide uh, on that. If you forward. A little bit, you can see some other cities, three of them in Ohio. Right here. These are all cities that have implemented a no spray mosquito management program. A follow up question, if you don't mind, if that's okay. Um, you mentioned that uh, the traps are very stinky. Does that become a nuisance in itself to the community and the people that have them close to their homes? The traps do have an odor, but it's not something like putrid that you're going to smell from far away. However, we did think that people probably would not want to change the stinky water. So when Megan and I, well, we really send grad students out to do this because, you know, I don't really <laughs> want to clean up the stinky water either. But what we do is 
We make the sinky water every week, we change it out. Well, what we think would work better in a community standpoint is to put a mosquito dunk in the stinky water, which many of you are probably familiar with if you have bird baths or whatever. And then it would really only need to be cleaned out like once a month. Um, we haven't decided if we will do that or if we'll have the people do it. I mean, I, ideally the to assess whether this could work longer term, I think we would probably want to have the community take care of it. But in terms of a test, we might want to do it. So we have to decide that yet. But our goal is to make this as um, le least of an imposition as possible. Thank you. Any more questions? Anybody else? Have, have you just, will the traps go in people's front and backyards? And do they volunteer? Uh, who, who do they contact? Do they contact Rebecca if they want to participate in this, or is it going to go on public right of ways and alleys? Where do the tra traps go? Great question. Um, so yeah, we're imagining that we'll have two traps in front yards and two traps in backyards, and um, we're going to canvas neighborhoods and hand out letters letting residents know about this project and, and their opportunity to um, become involved, and we'll let the residents decide which kind of treat or indicate which treatments or treat they would be interested in, in participating in. Um, if they're in the trap treatment, we're estimating that it would take them about 15 minutes per week just to monitor their traps like, and see what's going on. Um, and then obviously all participants would be letting members of our research team visit their property to do sampling for mosquitoes and beneficial insects. Did that answer your question adequately? Yeah, and how many traps are you envisioning in Bex, like one per block oh, or? Oh, four, per, four per household. For per household. For every household. For in the trap treatment. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. And then yeah, one of the light traps would be in like a wrap bucket of the five houses that are grouped together. Oh, like one. I'm sorry. Troy. Yes, please. Go ahead, Miss Side. That was my fault. I'm, I'm trying to I'm sorry. I'm trying to understand that too. So it's like one um per like you were, as you were showing a row of five houses or one per Ali shared. So yeah, it's not necessarily. So yeah, it's confusing. And I'm yeah. so sorry, because we have three different kinds of potential mosquito traps. So for the people that are in the, the trap treatment, they're going to have two of the gravid 80s traps, the black bucket ones, if we scroll up on those slides, and then two of the tubs of stinky water to collect the, the QX mosquitoes. Oops, I think a little too far down a bit. Right there. there we go. Yep. Okay, so they're gonna have two of the two of the gravid 80s trap for the mosquito, the 80s mosquitoes, the black ones, circular ones there, and then two of the keyless traps in their yard. But that's only for the trap treatment. And then for all of the other three remaining treatments, as well as in the trap treatment, we're gonna have those those CDC light traps that are just used to collect the adult mosquitoes that are flying around, so we can get a sense of in this general area within these blocks of five houses, how many mosquitoes are there? So think of the light trap as testing how did these different treatments work? Mm -hmm. It's monitoring how many are left in the air, you know, flying around. These are actually meant to trap them out and kill them out of the population in the trap treatment. But every mm -hmm. treatment will have one of those light traps because we need to see are there fewer in this treatment than in the, the control when we didn't add the traps. And then as we're doing this, we'll still, Franklin um, County will still come through with spray if needed. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to try, because these first two treatments, we don't want them to be sprayed. We want to compare like how many mosquitoes are around when, when people are, when Franklin County Public Health isn't allowed to spray because these people have opted out of the spray program. Mm -hmm. And then also how good are these specific traps at reducing mosquito populations. Um, but otherwise, the rest of Bexley will continue to be sprayed if, if and when West Nile virus is detected. We're going to target households that have already opted out of the spraying yeah. for the treatments one and two, because those folks are already not mm -hmm. getting the spray. So those would be good locations to sample with the traps and Perfect. To try to trap out with the traps since they aren't getting the spray. Ms. Feibel. Hi guys, thanks so much for coming and bringing your expertise and wanting to experiment with our with our city. So thank you so much. Um, I too have a relative 
who's really susceptible to huge wilts when she gets bit. Um, so I guess I'm curious if you were to put one of these traps, if you were to welcome one of those into your yard, would it make more mosquitoes come that way? Even like maybe your neighbors would even notice more mosquitoes. I guess that's one question I have. The other question I have is some of those cities that you suggested are no spray. Does that mean they don't get the public spray, but they can still opt to have their own spray? I can answer the first question and then maybe Rebecca might be able to answer the second question. So um, these two traps that we're using are to collect gravid female mosquitoes, which means those are the females that have already bitten someone and they're full of eggs ready to lay. Um, so these, these traps will attract those females and induce them to lay their eggs. The nice thing about the gravid 80s trap, the black circular one, is that the females fly in there and they actually do get trapped and they don't leave. Um, and so it should reduce the number of mosquitoes okay. in the area. Um, with the Culex traps that we're proposing, those females could leave, right, and bite again. Um, the Culex mosquitoes are not generally very aggressive biters. People usually do not get bitten by them a, a ton. Um, but that means that all of the eggs in the larvae that they put in there is, are going to die because there's a larvicide. So right. overall, in the long term, it should reduce um, populations. And then the kinds of females that are being attracted into people's properties are, are the ones that are not interested in biting. Um, the light traps are the mosquitoes that are bloodthirsty and on the hunt and looking for a meal. So um, those should hopefully help maybe a little bit in reducing mosquito numbers. Um, and then, you know, that's a good question. I don't know if those cities have disallowed residents from hiring professional mosquito companies to yeah. come to their yards or not. I can just imagine, you know, my, my, my sister-in-law is really, really, I mean, it's very evident and it happens like that. I mean, she has to take all kinds of very serious precautions. And so, you know, she would, I'm not sure she would be trusting it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I get it. If you saw her, you would understand. So anyway, I was just, I was just curious how that worked. So I'd love to figure that one out and uh, good luck. I love it. Thank you. And one thing, sorry, if I can just say real quick, one thing about folks that are very hesitant, you know, if they are interested in being part of our, our monthly spray group, those people will be, their yards will be treated with insecticides on a calendar basis, and we will pay for that as part of our grant. And I think what that could show is if the traps work just as well as that treatment, and they're directly involved, I think they're going to have firsthand evidence of you know, how well it, or, you know, how well it did or did not work. So I think we really want to engage people that are concerned um, to be part. And if they want, we will be looking for people to be part of the, the pesticide treatment group. Um, so if you know of folks that might be interested, definitely. I'm not out. sure she would be interested, but maybe if you could prove it at my house. <laughs> right. Then you could see. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. President. First off, before, like I, I have a couple things I want to say, but you guys, the amount of work you put into this and your the detail is so impressive. So I'm going to give you a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to kind of bolster some of what you guys were saying. And this, this isn't even the best map to show this, but this is an example of the most recent spraying that occurred in Bexley. And you can see all those red dots. Those are areas that weren't sprayed. So if you want to get a feel, I don't have a number in my head, but I would imagine 30 plus percent of our community is geographically not currently being sprayed. And in many of our yards, if we have a little bit of a deeper yard and we don't have an alley, uh, we're not even remotely getting sprayed. Like maybe our front yard is getting sprayed and our backyard is not. So there are a lot of conditions where currently even this type of spraying that's occurring is absolutely 100% ineffective at controlling any mosquitoes. Furthermore, when it comes to the, the comfort treatment, like a, somebody who's getting bitten a lot, we're treating for West Nile virus carrying mosquitoes. We treat after, right around dusk. That's a time when a lot of those nuisance spiders, I believe, are not active, right? So maybe I'm wrong. But all I know is that we're not really treating for the nuisance biting. So for people who are concerned about getting bit and their reaction, 
our current program isn't at all addressing that. So what, what's being proposed here has the potential to be a much more effective tool uh, than what we are currently doing. So I think that's what's really promising. And I think the fact that it's voluntary, try it out. We'll have numbers to back that out up is really, is really uh, exciting. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. And I had one more point, but I, oh yeah. And that is that the current traps that exist, my understanding is that they're pretty odorous, correctly? Correct, the ones that, that Franklin County Public Health is putting out are- Yeah, they use that trap. Yeah, it's, it's pretty safe. they're smelly. So they're out there and the people have them near them. Um, it's not like, it's not such a nuisance that it's just, if you got pretty close to it, you would start to realize it doesn't smell fresh, uh, but it's not like a huge hardship to people who choose to have that. And uh, so I just want to back up what you're saying. I think it's really going to be exciting to see what happens. And thank you for all the work you put into it. Ms. Todd. Quick question for uh, Mayor Kessler. The red, is oh, that? Uh oh, yeah. Sorry. Quick question <laughs> for Mayor Kessler. Up. That's cool. <laughs> um, the red, are those that have opted out? Yes, yeah, so, well, kind of. So yes, for, most, for the most part. And then I like Capital University doesn't get sprayed. I imagine either they opt out or for some reason, maybe because they don't always have dorms and, and I'm not sure what the reason is. So is, it, is it opt out? Red is opt out. Is it also because they don't have a alley? Like what are all of the red? It's, what it's, is all the red? It's opt out primarily, or it's a, it's a property that isn't covered by our sprays uh, for whatever reason. And I think there's another exhibit that's not that I could find on your website that shows the actual coverage, which is maybe something we can send to council. Yes, I, I can send that. We created a map that generates the the expected area that our spray should be reaching. Okay. Um, on that map, there's also red dots where areas that we turn off the sprayer. So sometimes we'll do that if there's pedestrians out mm -hmm. or if there's a car following us um, or any number of reasons. So it's not necessarily every single spot's an opt-out. Um, but I, I will mention that Bexley does have the most uh, opt-out um, <laughs> volunteer for that out of any of our jurisdiction. So it does um, you know, impact. Yeah, that would be helpful. I've always wondered. And then I also have always wondered why we collect in certain areas for West Nile and not, you know, I'm sure there's a science behind that too, which has been so interesting tonight. So any of that information would be great because residents are always asking and the more information, the better. Yeah, thank you. Ms. What? Robinson, I'm oh, sorry. I just think to, to piggyback off what you're saying, there's a, mis, there's a misconception and an expectation that when we spray, we're eliminating the nuisance mosquitoes yeah. and we're not so like you know people we frequently get tons of complaints when there are mosquitoes out so we're feeling those all the time at the front desk and then when we announce that we're spraying we have a lot of people upset that we're spraying and then when we're done spraying we have more people calling and saying why do i still get bitten by mosquitoes so right now this is not like the most perfect plant so it would be nice to have a better option I am with you all. <laughs> Ms. Robinson. Well, I, I also want to say to the three of you and to Sarah back there from Franklin County Public Health, I mean, this has been just a complete learning ex journey. I hate the word expression, any kind of journey, but it has been. Um, and to learn what we currently are doing in the city and how ineffective, as we've just discussed, it is. I encourage council to you know take some time because we could spend probably an hour and trust me, <laughs> you'll have tons of questions. We could spend a lot of time doing it now, but please take some time to, to really look at that PowerPoint and please forward any questions that you have to me and I'll make sure that I forward that, that I'm on because I know what we want to do is create a program that's successful for our city and that really helps us bolster our green initiatives. And this is absolutely, I think, going to be um, something that's going to give us a lot of information and help us make decisions about how we treat for mosquitoes in a way that's effective, not only to treat mosquitoes, but also to, to keep our city healthy, which is what we want. So please email me your questions and I'll make sure that you guys get it. And thank you, all of you, for all of the hard work that you've done. I've learned more about mosquitoes. I'm going to say, like, let's pretend that you're talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about mosquitoes. <laughs> Dumb it down and you guys have been really great. So thank you. Thank you for bringing your class here tonight. Yeah, I think you're one of our most popular presenters with uh, all this participation. It sounds like uh, we have an appointment with you maybe this time next year to go over the results. And I think we'll all be uh, sort of excited about hearing how that goes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Public comments. Mr. McPeak, do we have any speaker slips? I do not have any speaker slips. 
Natalie, any speaker slips coming in? No speaker slips, sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, President's report, the only thing I have to report is uh, I did receive this last week a certified letter from community builders and they have expressed uh, that they will continue to move forward on their Livingston Avenue project. Um, and that is uh, declaring their intention to do so. City attorney report. I actually had a couple of things. One, one, one more, much more significant than the other dimension. And I just want folks to be re to recognize this. Um, there is in the Ohio House pending and likely to pass House Bill 512, which affects um, what the city has to pay for police. Well, you don't have to worry about police. It also covers fire, but police pension. Um, right now, the city of Bexley, all cities contribute 19.5% of officer salaries to the police and fire pension fund. The, and the employees contribute 10% of theirs, do you know? 12. 12%. Thank you. Um, so and the, under this bill, the 19.5% will become, stay effective in 2022, but in 2023, it will go up to 20.9% and eventually capping out in January of beginning in 2027 at 26.5%. So that's an extra 7% on the budget that the city will have to absorb if this passes. And again, I think it's likely to pass that will that the city will have to be paying for employees um, PFPF contributions. This is not money that goes in employees' pockets directly. So as salaries go up, uh, the pension obligation for the city is going to go up too, and that's something that we'll have to be budgeted for. Um, that's the first one. The second one, just to, just uh, I shouldn't say for giggles and laughs because it is. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just I didn't hear you say the house bill. What was that? Five twelve. <laughs> um, it shouldn't say giggles and laughs, but I just want you to know that there is a uh, bill pending. I think in the Ohio House that is not likely to go anyplace, but it would prohibit cities and counties from contracting with any companies that discriminate against the firearms industry. I don't know what that means but I think it's more of a political statement, but it went around the Ohio Municipal Attorneys Association um, um, listserv, and uh, I just thought I'd share that with you. So that's all. Keep us updated on that. City Auditor, Mr. McPeak, do you have a report for us? Uh, no significant updates. Just want to thank Jessica Saad and Troy um, for meetings this past week and the rest of you for meetings that are upcoming. Um, very interested in learning from you. What are some of the things that I can get you on a monthly basis that will just help you become better informed um, and have a cheat sheet, we'll say, on just city finances? So that is certainly my goal and hope to roll that out in February. Um, Beecher has been great, bringing me up to speed as well as Ben. Um, so with all that being said, you know, as he walks through the December results, if you have questions, certainly circle back with me or Beecher. Um, we will chase them down and uh, get back to you quickly. So thank you all. There I am. Hey. What's up, guys? <laughs> Our camera disappeared on us. There's another one. Okay. Let's turn that off. I'm so sorry for the internet having to watch that. Yeah, it disappeared. Mr. McPeak, thank you for taking the time. I know you're meeting with all of us and uh, appreciate, and I think we are really going to benefit uh, this year from your energy and your fresh perspective. And I uh, definitely encourage city council members to come with, to you with ideas and, and things that could help us and help you. Mr. Mayor, would you like to take us through your administrative update? I would group? love to uh, begin with the uh, service department. I believe that Mr. Andy, how are you doing? Hi, Mayor. Hi, Mr. President, Council. Um, I have my report attached, but I do not have anything to add to it tonight. Any questions for Mr. Bayshore? Andy, uh, I know that the uh, guys have been pulling a lot of late shifts and weekend shifts, clearing salt, and it feels like every time the snow stops, it starts up again. It's just like just enough to need us to come out, but not enough to feel <laughs> significant. So thank you for all the work you guys have been doing. Thank you. No problem at all. I'm leaning on pretty hard, but the department has been doing an excellent job. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andy. Mm -hmm. And we have with us Chief Goff. Jess, would you mind sharing your microphone with the chief? Is it loud enough? Yeah. Not for the people listening. Sorry, Al. Yeah, I don't have any. Oops. I don't have anything additional other than the uh, tax report. Unless you have anything of interest that I can answer for you. Any questions for? The yep. I just saw. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and if you could pass this along, you called it the C company Yes. Um, for their work um, that they've been doing for the yes. city and for uh, the city of Columbus, because it sounds like their work is is helping many other municipalities. So thank you. And if you could share that with them, we'd appreciate I it. Actually, I already did. Matt reached out earlier and I, as a reminder, <laughs> it was a reminder to me to do it anyway. So uh, yeah, the, the emails have been sent and um, the yeah, other hard workers, so I don't expect more of that on a consistent basis. I mean, they do a great job, so it's like everybody up there. But nothing else. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Uh, Mike Price, Recreation and Parks, Parks and Recreation. Yeah, no, nothing to add to my written report. Uh, it looks like your background has changed. Did you fix the chair yet? Yes, I'm now on a couch. So. <laughs> Great. I'm stepping it up. I know that the community is very excited about the ice rink. Excellent job to you and your crew for getting that out. And uh, I saw some sticking pucks coming up over the next couple of days. It's pretty exciting. That, wow. Any questions for Mr. Price? Ms. Seibel? Yeah. Mike, I just wanted to thank you for giving myself and council members Saad and Marcelino the tour of the uh, upcoming Senior Center at 420 North Cassidy. Uh, to my colleagues here, if you haven't had a chance to walk through, highly, highly recommend it. Um, if you don't get a chance, you can go to the grand opening. I think it's Sunday, February 13th, Super Bowl Sunday. That's What's correct. the time on that, Mike? Yeah. You know, I believe it's going to be at, it's either three or four. I will, I will make sure that gets out. It's, yeah, as long as it's not it's a halftime. <laughs> it's, it's a pregame. It's a pregame. So you can go off to other, other events if you have a uh, schedule. And that's if you're over 55, you can watch the Super Bowl from the, uh, from the rec room. That's right. That's <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if, and if any other council members, obviously, please reach out to me. If you'd like to take a tour, I'd be happy to take you around. Thank you, Mike. Any other questions? Oh, Jess, I'm sorry. Uh, Mike, I know we discussed at the um, uh, rec meeting that Barb uh, Jinx Triffin isn't huge on uh, a lot of PR, but I just wanted to recognize, I think that award is awesome um, that that Park and Rec is going to start doing for volunteers. And I know she's going to, it's going to be called the Barb Jinx Triffin Award, and it'll be I'll let you kind of talk to council a little bit more about it, but I was excited to hear that because we have so many Bexley runs by having the volunteers and it's, I've said it's infectious, it's contagious. Um, everybody's just willing. And if they, if they say no, the next, that's just because they're on too many things already and the next door neighbor is ready to, uh, to jump in. So I'm so excited that you have this award. If you want to talk a little bit more about it, I would love for you to share. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Jess. Um, yeah, Barb James Triffin is a Bexley resident, longtime Bexley resident that has been an integral part of what we've done for decades at the rec department, frankly. Uh, she has volunteered so much of her time um, helping to create programs, helping to uh, run programs for us. Uh, she is uh, obviously a strong advocate and supporter of everything Jeffrey Park. Uh, she ran a blog uh, called The Magic of Jeffrey Woods for a number of years, um, taking pictures, chronicling the different uh, seasons at Jeffrey Park. She also spearheaded uh, efforts to restore uh, the statue at, at Jeffrey Mansion, uh, which was done this past year with uh, help from Barb, as well as the Community Foundation. And, you know, we've been for a while trying to find a way to honor her efforts and support of our department. Uh, Jess, as you mentioned, she's not one uh, to, to take a lot of credit or be in the limelight. We had even had discussions about doing a proclamation at, at City Council, and she just doesn't really necessarily like being put in those settings, uh, which we obviously respect, but but nonetheless, we also want to honor uh, what she's done for our department, our community, and so uh, we've also at the same time been talking for a while about how we can 
uh, honor the the vast number of uh, volunteers it takes to do what we do at the rec department. We rely so heavily on our volunteer coaches or 5K run volunteers, splish splash and dash volunteers. Uh, you know, again, we rely so heavily on our volunteers, and we're blessed and lucky to have a community that's so willing to help out. And so, this is the start of 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 taking an additional step to make sure we're honoring. Uh, the efforts and help of uh, of those are in and around our community. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. Uh, I'm going to move on to Beecher Hale and uh, financial report, and we have some motions. And Mr. Auditor, do you want to present any of this? Or Beecher, I see Beecher. Present. There he is. He's lurking in the shadows. <laughs> Beecher, you're muted. Oh, I was gonna say, I apologize if it's dark. I forgot and connected to the meeting while I was still in my car. And then I didn't want to bother the mayor to reconnect me to the meeting if I disconnected from my Bluetooth. So my apologies. <laughs> um, but you have in front of you the, um, the December report and I'm bringing it back up on my screen. Um, and of course, the highlight is that income tax was $2.6 million above budget. And while that's great news, you might think Ben and, or the mayor and I did a lousy job of budgeting, um, but we didn't have any idea what the impact of COVID was going to be. And um, we just assumed our income tax was going to go down. We picked a number, we reduced it by 5%. If you look over to the year over year comparison, you'll notice that we are actually up $1.9 million. Um, I believe just by looking at some of our top uh, with top taxpayers and, with, and withholders, um, it could have been due to people working at home. I can't say that for sure, but we had a big increase in um, withholders that don't have a location in the city. So that would indicate to me they're withholding that residents, withholding for residents that work um, there, but live in the city of Bexley. Just a couple other things of note that might be, you know, raise questions. You'll see that grant revenue is under budget, but if you look down to the second line uh, under general government operating, you'll see that grant expenditures are also under budget. But even if that wasn't the case, a lot of times there's a lag time between the time we expend the money and the time we can get reimbursed from the grants. Um, additionally, one that raised my eyebrows because I thought we had taken care of this um, was the $70,000 in the CIC, but not to worry, I'll just get with the CIC and get that collected. Um, and we're down a little bit in uh, franchise fees. So I'll work with our new right of way coordinator who would also be working on that to try to find out why that's going. I know WOW was purchased by another company and I don't know, I haven't had a chance to look to see, make sure that they're paying us a relatively same amount. Um, then our operating expenditures came in good under the, under the budget, even with additional appropriations. We ended up, oh, I lost the number now on my little screen here, about $350,000, I believe, um, under budget. Other expenditures were over budget, but that's simply because, as the mayor will tell you, at the end of the year, we had more money than we anticipated thanks to income tax, and we su supported the capital improvements fund, um, the new infrastructure development fund and the, um, the budget stability fund. So with that, if anybody has any questions for me? None? Teacher, thank you so much. That's an excellent thorough presentation. I'll also point out that um, I believe if I'm reading this correctly, our ending fund cash balance, despite the transfers to the infrastructure development fund and uh, capital fund, we're a million dollars over what we had even budgeted. Uh, so we're still a we million dollars to our general fund with capital yep. fund transfer, uh, infrastructure transfer, which is uh, excellent, so. Yes, sir, that's correct. Mr. Auditor, anything to add? Nothing to add, thank you. Thank you, Beecher. <laughs> You're welcome. That is our most thorough Beecher presentation of the of the uh, actuals yet. I appreciate that. Don't leave yet, though, Beecher, because we have I four uh, So I, I made a big stink last year about how rare these were. 
And then I'm, I'm like egg on my face because, and maybe you can explain this a little bit, Beecher. What, what happens is we close our POs in middle of December ish. And then we carry forward money that we know is when invoices are going to come forward. And then we can't open POs for our 2022 budget year until about a week or more after. I think it was like January 10th this year, maybe Beecher, that we opened that's, our PO. That's correct. I mean, what happens is in the beginning of the year is when you have the most of the time. Um, and our current assistant finance director, um, um, Angelo Kelly, used to be the deputy auditor, a similar role at the city of Whitehall. And they had many, many more times than me, she said, because we do work hard to basically not use up council's time. I and mean, there's really, we, we will spend the money, um, either we'd have to budget it for this year or, well, we will end up using it this year's budget. But um, it's just a matter of we have to close out those purchase orders, which we would have used. And sometimes um, then, the, then what happens is we have a purchase order date, which ends up post dating the time we got the goods or services. And we that can will mainly happen in January. Right. So the invoices have come in. They have a date in early January. There's not yet a purchase order open. Purchase orders get open. We have to pay the old invoice. If it's above $3,000, it requires a council motion. Each one of these has a different story. Beams is our fuel supplier. Rumpke is our trash contract. Uh, OHM is uh, uh, Jason City, who does planning consulting for the building department and zoning. Karen Boker, the same thing, architectural consulting. So um, I can answer any questions you have about these. The Rumpke one stands out a little bit because if you'll recall, we, when we went through the budget, we realized we had not been increasing our budget for refuse. And so we were under budget and refuse we had to bump it up a little bit. We still got a straggling invoice at the end of the year. There was no money at all left over from the prior year to carry forward. So that's why you have such a large invoice. Uh, we think we, I think that we think that we have adequate capacity through the rest of the year, but we'll continue to keep an eye on that. Um, so I think the motion is a simple, Mr. Fischel is a simple motion to approve the payment of these invoices. Yeah, and it's a voice vote. Um, and I'm happy to, any of us will answer any questions you have. The only question I have is, are these, um, for services from 2021 or are they services that will occur or did occur in 2022? Right. So my understanding is that beams is from 2021. Is that correct, Beecher? That is correct. All of those. Why? Well, let me not speak. I do know the Rumpke. That's the December Rumpke bill. And so we're using January's appropriation for December. And these all represent. Sorry, Beecher. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Go ahead. They all represent um, accounts where we closed out the year and did not carry forward funding. In the case of the Rumpke, there was no funding to carry forward to pay for that. That's just true, also true of beams. The price of fuel went up quite a bit the second half of last year. So we didn't have adequate fuel uh, funding. So we are using 2022 budget to pay for 2021 invoices. Having said that, that's not a... I mean, that's not an absolutely totally unusual condition because there is a little bit of bleed over at the end of the year. And can I interrupt you, Mayor, just a little bit? Please. See, on the uh, so for example, on the Rumpke, and I may sound like I'm, I don't know, don't care enough, but we budget for 12 months. We're going to pay 12 months. Um, I guess, you know, you have to budget 13 months one year in order so that you can carry forward that 12th month and pay it in um, January. Um, but that seems like an exercise in just moving numbers around to me. But however, the state auditors would prefer we do it that way. Yep. yep. There is one more invoice that's not on this list and I'll tell you why there's a uh, invoice to our building department inspector who comes around. He has a really bad habit of waiting until the very end of the year and, and invoicing us for the entire year. I had a fairly direct conversation with him about this about a year or two ago. It happened again this year. so. Before I bring that back to you guys, I wanna have another chat with him and, and we're gonna discuss that because I'm incredibly unhappy about it. So <laughs> I just want that to be, you to know that there is at least one more hanging around uh, that we'll have to potentially bring back to you. And I don't think there are any others, but it's not impossible that something shows up that was has a date of invoice that's in early January before the PO was opened up. And any other questions or, yep. Is that Len, the building inspector? Well, Len is a as a employee or contractor of Mike Verica, who's Architecture gotcha. Inc. 
So I like Len. Don't go too hard on Len. They're great, yeah. but they do need to <laughs> bill us right. like regularly as opposed to waiting. Kind of a bizarre practice. It really isn't. It messed up our budget from, yeah. for 2022 because we had no idea. And it, despite having asked for those numbers quite a few times. So it's, it's bad for all of us. Yeah, that's exactly. Jen. So just to reiterate, this doesn't affect the bottom line for 2022 by spending this now at the beginning. Are we going to find ourselves at the end of the year going, oh, now we're, we're short? No, none of these do. Okay. I'm a little concerned about the, arc, the building inspector one. Understood. But that's yeah. one that but I'll address. None of these here that we none are of, looking at today are going to affect the, the, our 2022 bottom line. That, that, that is correct. Okay. We're fine. As far as I know. My understanding. <laughs> and if it's if I'm wrong, it's uh, Mr. McPeak's fault. Just for the record. <laughs> but to be clear, the expenses will be captured in 2022, but it's unclear if it will be that's, leading to being out of budget. That's a good point. Let so me just, let me clarify. I, I assume that your question meant that we're not going to be in a position where we're inadequately funded in these budget items for 2022. And from what I know today, that is correct. As far as I know. Yes. Thank you. Any more questions? Are you looking for a motion then on this right now? Um, yes, I am looking for a motion. Motion to approve invoices received in early January before purchase orders were opened up for the year. Second. Look for a second. Second. Motion by Ms. Lamke, second by Mr. Klingler. Mr. Mc or, I, voice vote, I guess, right? Yeah. Oh. Yep. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hale. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. You too, sir. All right. Try to make this quick, guys. You said it every week. I do. I was going to recognize our Cub Scout, but I believe our, our Boy Scout, I should say, but he's, I'll do that in a second. Okay. A <laughs> um, couple things coming up for you to know about. We have a CIC retreat is on Friday afternoon. It will be occurring at um, the rec room at 420 North Cassie. I'm really trying to like get this name to stick. Okay. So I'll keep working it. Um, and this is exciting. February 9th, the Board of Education will hold their first meeting here in this space. You'll notice that camera over there that we're not using right now because it's not totally hooked up. It's fancy and new, and I think we're going to put another one over here. So they're, they're upgrading our AV a little bit. Thank you, Board of Education. Um, uh, they've, just, they've got like, you know, it's, it's more controlled than ours. Um, they have better IT staff. They have more comprehensive, not better IT staff. They have more IT staff, I should say. Um, I have a rel relatively wordy chief of police search update hidden here. This is very similar to an email I'm about to send out to anyone who has asked about the process or expressed interest in it. We have engaged Ralph Anderson and Associates as our search consultant after interviewing uh, three potential consultants. I'm also finalizing an engagement with um, Gail Saunders, who is a local PR executive who has uh, a firm that has done similar community engagement outreach over the Columbus chief of police and other like campaigns for the city of Columbus and other area cities. And I'm asking her to help us with reaching out to community groups that are interested in providing input into the process, summarizing all of the input that she gets into and, and looking to a community survey about the next chief position or the next chief, the same position. Um, in term and, and using that community engagement report to help our search consultant uh, as he prepares a candidate profile and begins to advertise the position. So that's a search, that's a engagement process that'll take the better part of February. I expect, a, expect the report at the end of February, early March, position gets posted early March, and we'll start to have candidates uh, interviews at, later in April is the current timeline based upon what is coalescing as, as I think a pretty solid plan. Um, I'm gonna be providing weekly email updates to anyone who asks for them. So right now about 180 email addresses on that list. Uh, I did ask, I did say early on, I think I came right out of the gate and I said, I would like to create a uh, process and I sort of outlined it. 
I talked about having an advisory committee. And the more time has passed and people have expressed interest, as I just mentioned, I have an email list of 150 people. There are a lot of people that want to be on an advisory committee. And I understand that. And I have felt increasingly uncomfortable with selecting eight people to somehow represent uh, our community because we are, we are small enough that we know each other and we can reach out to groups and, and quantify and, and have a uh, direct connection. So I'm currently not thinking that I'm gonna do a, a formal advisory committee. Instead, I'm gonna have a really robust community engagement process. I'm gonna have regular calls for updates where anyone can join the call and ask questions and just have a very open, like accessible process throughout. So that's my current thought process. I'm, I'm open to any ideas about that. If you guys disagree with that change of tactic, I'm just too concerned that there will be a lot of focus on who's not in the committee, as opposed to just making sure that everyone's voice is heard. So, uh, and I understand many of you said comments that were somewhat consistent with that idea early on. So you're right, good job. Um, <laughs> so uh, any, any questions or thoughts on that before I move on? Yep. You were talking about the 150 who have reached out and you try and contact them weekly. Is that something I like that you're going to do that community engagement and, um, and open on that up? Are, is that something you could put on the blast for, you yeah. know, there's, there's a lot of people who know how to reach out in the community and there's yeah. a lot who do not. Sure. No, no. I'll, we have a page and we'll keep updates on the blast for sure. Okay. It might not be, I mean, it's probably not going to be as lengthy as, right. as what I'm sending out, but it's, it'll at least point people to the lengthy material that they can read. Yeah. It'll all be accessible. I like it. And I, to be clear, I did not have 150 people asked to be on the, the advisory committee. It includes stakeholder groups and people that I just know are interested in it. But, but there was a lot of interest, enough so that it was clear to me that if I selected a manageable small number, that it would be, un, un, I think, kind of construe the process to be more closed than I think it, I want it to be. Um, at our next council meeting, we will be presenting Drexel Avenue concepts for calming traffic and providing for multimodal transportation options. There were two primary options that we presented to residents on a call that we had last week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a preview because some of you have fielded calls on this. So I just wanna make this context really clear. And so that if you hear anything more about it in the next two weeks, you're armed with some more information. So we came into this process um, back in May of 21, we had a resident meeting with Drexel Avenue residents and other interested parties who just wanted to come to it. and Slowing traffic um, and making for safer pedestrian crossings was, were both priorities that really emerged strongly out of that meeting, which is not surprising. And so we developed concepts for Drexel that would basically narrow the street. And I'm gonna show you these real quickly and we're gonna go into more depth at the next meeting. The first option narrows the street. This, these, gray, these gray areas, those are bump outs. So the, that's beyond where the current curb is. It's narrowing the street. That's not gonna be concrete. It's gray just to show you where it is. That would be grass or eventually street trees potentially or some sort of landscaping, but it would be green and natural. And there's room for narrow medians in places. And so these green in the middle represent where we would have medians that would be landscaped lightly. They're five foot wide, so they couldn't support big trees or anything like that. But they would create safe landings for pedestrians. They would narrow the street physically and this would happen all along Drexel. So anywhere there's an intersection like this, you would have that street narrowing, you would have a protected crosswalk, and there are a lot of advantages to that. Pedestrians get out past the parked cars where they're much more visible when they cross. Cars that are pulled up to the intersection have a better field of view because they don't have parked cars at the intersection block in their view. And cars that are driving on Drexel because of the physical narrowing of the street are much less comfortable driving 35 mile per hour posted speed limit. Now it's posted 35 because it's a state route. We can't slow it without first proving that the traffic is driving slower. The way to prove the traffic is driving slower is to make the traffic drive slower. The way to make the traffic drive slower is to narrow the street. So this is the primary concept that came into this. But around the same time, actually a little bit afterwards, the best bikes, best bicycle friendly Bexley plan was adopted and created initially that plan called for bike lanes in Drexel. And we showed some of these early, early concepts to the bike plan consultant and said, you know, we have some ideas to calm Drexel, but they wouldn't physically don't accommodate a bike path. And so the wording changed a little bit and it said for us to study bike lanes on Drexel. 
So we did. We created, uh, we, we went through a ton of different scenarios. And the one that allows for the safest bike traffic and also the safest pedestrian would not allow for parking on both sides of the street. There's just not physically room. We can't legally put bike lanes both directions in any configuration, plus parking on both sides, plus two lanes of traffic. Something had to give. So in this concept, it's what's called a cycle track concept. It has a lot of advantages over one where you would have one on each side, uh, keeps bikes out of door zones. Uh, either option would not have parking on one side anyway. So the cycle track concept, it could happen either on the east or west side. We showed this happening on the uh, east side, but the next, because of some feedback, we're gonna show a mock-up where it's on the west side of the street. Makes more sense for a couple of different reasons. But either way, you lose parking on one side of the street. And there's some other negatives. Um, you know, there's a, a little bit less of a sheltered pedestrian crossing. There's a little bit more going on on the street. So the feedback we received from residents was universally that live on the street against the idea of the bike lanes, which, as I said, even before I presented it, which probably shouldn't have said this, I was like, I'm not going to be surprised if nobody likes this idea, which is turned out I, I predicted it accurately. We do have bike advocates that are in favor of it. They were also on the call. I felt that it was our duty. It is our duty to present this and think about it seriously. And I want your guys' way in on this. I, this is not a, normally we would just make infrastructure changes, you apprise and move on. This is something that's more sensitive. And I think I, I don't this decision alone. So at the next council meeting, uh, we'll have our pros and cons. And I'm going to ask for your feedback on it. We're going to have residents here as well. So expect. There I am again, unfortunately. <laughs> Should we just start at the beginning, call to order and roll call and pledge allegiance? Yeah, it looks to me like we, I'm, I'm, I've, I have an audio back up here and it looks like we're still live on YouTube. So if anyone is on YouTube, we lost internet here for a little bit, but we are back. Uh, and I'm going to share the screen again. So I apologize for that delay. I think we kind of went down as I was talking about uh, the race. That we would more about faith, and then Jess Saad said that uh, you were grateful we were sending mailings. Thank you. You're welcome. So, any, any other questions or thoughts? Mr. Clayman, uh, is your vision the medians will have electric for lighting lights to go on the street trees? So I don't, I don't know that we have. I don't know that we are thinking street trees in the medians. Oh. So these are five foot medians. So, for example, the. Uh, Main Street ones are eight foot medians. The ones on Drexel or sorry, Bryden are, you know, 12 to 15 foot medians. And so that's one of the reasons we didn't use medians more extensively because we would have, we first looked at medians. As wide as Drexel is, it's not as wide as Bexley Park, Bryden or Fair. So it can't accommodate the U-turn traffic that allows people access to their driveways. So the medians make sense 
sporadically and sparingly. Uh, and they start to actually become even a little bit better north of fair, but um, there aren't that many of them. They'll probably, I would imagine they would have low uh, shrubs of some sort maybe. So they'll have some presence, but they're not gonna have the same presence as, uh, as Main Street, or they could have some smaller ornamental trees. But that's something to think about as well as they have electrical. I don't have an answer for that yet. Jen, did you have a question? Um, I did, but I think it, it's something that I could ask um, not and not take up council's time. It was just a numbers thing and it's either that my glasses aren't as strong as they used to be or uh, the numbers for distance. Um, I was questioning how th those bump outs, how deep they would be. And then is that equal, or is, are we talking equidistant on each side so that the center lanes are 11 feet? Yes, so there's part. seven and a half feet on both sides. Um, uh, 10 feet is, is uh, 10 feet is, a nor is like a standard travel lane, maybe in a residential setting. 11 feet is the minimum on a state route. Okay. Seven and a half or eight feet is what you need for a parking space. It's going to force cars not to want to park too far out into the traffic. Sure. Um, but it's not the it's not a different where it's parked is not a different width than today. So we know that cars can successfully park on both sides of the street and accommodate traffic. We are adding that five foot spacer in the middle, you know. Okay. Um, and there's some question as to whether or not we would use the yellow line, like the the marked medians, because you know. That actually kind of increases the idea that like you're, it, it's more markings aren't necessarily helpful. So that's that sort of stuff needs to be worked out, but that's the physical infrastructure that we're talking about. Okay. Jess. Financially, what's the difference between plan like A, called out the medium plan, and then plan B, the bike lane plan? Plan B is a lot cheaper. <laughs> I mean, that's true. They're both, uh, we're, we're hoping to accommodate both of them within our OPWC budget. It's actually, it's not the curb work that's that expensive. It's the fact that every time we do that, we have to- And can you clarify which plan is cheaper? The bike, the lane- The bike lane bike. plan is cheaper? It is less expensive. Okay. It is more economical in, in certain ways. It's less economical in others. Uh, plan A traps, traps stormwater more because it has additional uh, permeable surface and it's less- so, uh, but it does require additional stormwater infrastructure to do the bump outs. So we have to add catch basins that don't exist today on, on either side, if they're added. Okay, any other questions? That was my BS answer to that, but if you want the real engineering answer, you can ask that question again next, next week and then compare how uh, accurate it was. By the way, I did, I did want to recognize you and thank you for coming to our meeting. We have a, a Boy Scout with us today. Would you mind telling us real quickly what troop you're with? 603, and, and what's your name? Reeds, thank you so much for joining us. Good to have you here today. Hi. And Reed, I assume, are you here for a, a civic badge of some sort? Citizenship, okay. Well, in order to get that, you have to stay until the end of the meeting and then write us an essay. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Oh, well, you just wait. It's about to happen. Um, the, yeah, does anyone have some real concern, concerns about the, can we get it in a fight about something? I'm not sure. I think uh, that we should honestly consider putting in some power into whatever medians that we actually have here and making sure that we're paying attention to. Is this a disagreement? I don't know. If this I don't is know. <laughs> Potentially it could be. And, uh, so if you were thinking no, I'm thinking yes. And I, but I genuinely mean that to think for it to see what the cost would be now versus having to consider installing at a later date. Okay. Check there that off. Well done. Yeah. yeah. I am offended at that suggestion. Uh, we had, uh, speaking of differences of opinion, we had a great, we did have a very good Livingston Avenue workshop. It was fairly heated at times. So if anyone wants to watch the video of that, there was disagreement. Uh, but uh, in the lobby, you'll see the boards. Uh, we've invited public to come in and continue to mark up uh, with post-it post notes their ideas. We have an online survey, and there's more information at bexley.org slash Livingston. Yes, Jen Robinson. Um, and how long will those lovely posters be in the lobby? Uh, till next Friday. Perfect. Thanks. Yep.
And then um, at least, you know, I, <laughs> give or take, not, not less than next Friday though. Um, the Youth Interaction Policy Working Group, our next one is Thursday morning. It's been a while since we've had one. Uh, we'll be reviewing the survey that went out in the fall and talking about best practices. We'll keep you apprised of that. Um, I do wanna let you know that uh, Rec Board, Architecture Review Board and ESAC all have open seats right now and those are posted on our website. And we put some stuff in the blast about that, but I wanted you guys to be aware of that. So if you know of anybody who would be great, thanks Matt McPeak for becoming auditor and leaving rec board. That wasn't polite, but uh, Sorry about that. that's also a disagreement that I have with you, sir. Oh, yeah. here we go. <laughs> True. Uh, and then we did submit four LOIs at least. I, I tried to get them all here to the Bexley Community Foundation. Asterisk, have submitted or are about to submit. Hallie's aware of all of them. Um, our year of the parks is a very generic LOI, just talking about what we've all talked about, just all the different park programs that we're looking at mm. putting in in 2022 slash 23. So it's more of a, like a warning, Bexley Community Foundation, and we want to get your feedback on this fairly large, ambitious concept. Uh, Hispanic Heritage Pride Month, and did I leave out another aspect? Asian specific events. Yep. Um, our police community housing assistance, we've asked the community foundation to assist us through that program, as I said we would, and a police appreciation week uh, concept with a community award ceremony, sending an officer to the event um, uh, in DC, and uh, police appreciation event in general. So those are all either submitted or on their way. Here, some photos, got a photo, and I'll, I'll stop. You can look at the photos yourself, but there's a Livingston Avenue workshop. I'm not stopping, I'm still going our guys at work. Uh, and this was great. John Lang from, I think Troop 166, organized a litter pickup on the Livingston on-ramp. He is uh, currently my second favorite scout. To you, Reed. You, Reed, you're my favorite right, <laughs> right here. But we, we got a ton of litter off of the ramp, which is just such a rewarding project. So we'll have some trash talks coming up in the next couple months. I would love for you guys to join. And then this is a sneak peek of the red oh, room. Wow. Oh. So it kind of wow. it kind of tells you what some paint and carpeting can do in a space. Is that a nightclub? Or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Gonna, it's gonna look good as a uh, for the for the council ping pong ping pong tournament. I just want you to know that I'm a very low seed on that whole uh, that whole uh, setup. Well, so you're not a council. That's true. Never mind. Well, by the charter, well, for the charter, I can participate in the ping pong. For the charter, I can participate in the ping pong tournament. Uh, but this is we're having the CIC retreat at Cassidy, so uh, fittingly, there will be plenty of parking. Um, and I'm sorry, Mr. President, that concludes my exceptionally long report after promising a short one. That's okay. Full of good stuff. You're consistent. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's move on then to uh, uh, Mark Fischel can take over here for the All right, we have one item on the consent agenda, the minutes from the January 11, 2022 City Council meeting. Thank you. Do we have any comments or questions on about the consent agenda from City Council? Do we have any comments or questions about the consent agenda from the community out in the audience? <laughs> If not, I'll take a motion on this. Motion to pass the consent agenda. Motion by Mr. Klingler. Second. Second by Ms. Robinson. And give us the roll call, Mr. McPeak. Mr. Marcelino. Yes. Mr. Markham. Yes. Ms. Saad. Yes. Ms. Lamke. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. Ms. Bible. Yes. Yes. So I think that I'm not trying to do your job, Mr. Markham, but yeah. I think we're down to second readings. We are. We're going to no skip third right through the thirds into the second. All right. Second reading of Ordinance 1-22 to amend Chapter 2020.01, Rule 8 of the codified ordinances of the city of Bexley that was introduced by Mr. Markham. Is it just me or you feel like you got to stretch a little bit right now? Oh, I'm old. All right, let's see this. Um, this was introduced uh, last uh, meeting, and it is just some slight modifications to our uh, chair positions. And if you scroll down for me just a little bit, I've got them highlighted. Um, 
made a couple additions since the last time we were here, decided Jen Robinson didn't have enough to do, so I threw in some extra work there for her, uh, showing that she actually, of course, as strategic, has uh, <laughs> traditionally helped plan our, uh, our planned, mostly uh, plan our retreats and our strategy sessions. Also, just to designate the coordination and curating the strategic vision of city council. And uh, I think curating is appropriate word there. I like the word curate. Yes, Ms. Son. Could we um, possibly add to her role that she would also um, <laughs> be uh, our caterer, that she would bring uh, the meals? <laughs> she has a lot of shadow shadow responsibilities. If you continue to roll down just a little bit, I think there's maybe one more thing. Uh, that's what we introduced last time. Again, the Zoning and Development Committee. We have restored uh, legally the overseeing of those zoning appeal hearings that we all enjoy so much. And Mr. Klinger will be happy to take those for the next two years. And one more scroll down, please. And then just uh, addition there on the Safety and Health Committee uh, pertaining to Mayor's Court at it as well. Any uh, questions or comments from city council about this? If not, it would be my opinion that this might be the first good offering for the consent agenda. But well, don't we need to amend this? Did oh, do we do need changes? to amend that, don't we? Yes. Um, yes. So, <laughs> I, I make, I, I will, uh, <laughs> I, I will, uh, what, what's the term I'm supposed to use here? My make brain's a motion to amend. I'm going to make a motion to amend ordinance 01-22. Second. We'll take a second by Ms. Feibel. And uh, let's get a roll call on the amendment, please. Mr. McPeak. Okay. Um, Ms. Saad. Wow. Oh. Yes. Mr. Marcelino? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Ms. Feibel? Yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Mr. Klingler? Yes. And Ms. Lanky? Yes. All right, it is so amended, 7-0. And then now, I, if there are no objections, I think uh, this might be a good candidate for first consent agenda addition to uh, next meeting of the year. Is that good? All right, so noted. All right, we have a second reading of Ordinance 02-22 to authorize $15,000 in supplemental appropriations for calendar year 2022 for paying expenses associated with the Chief of Police search process introduced by Ms. Lamke. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to our mayor to see if there's been any changes in figures or if anyone has any questions. Uh, the, the ordinance as drafted is still on point for uh, I think what we're looking at. Happy to answer your questions. Any further questions on this? All right. All right, let's move on. I understand there's no action on the table ordinances and there are no first readings this evening. So we, I, I, I am done with my responsibilities for the time being. Well, that was rough. Let's move through the uh, committees then. Ms. Lamke, Finance Committee report. No report. Ms. Feibel, Service and Environmental Committee. I had uh, my very first ESEC as well as my very first Bexley Tree and Gardens. You were uh, busy right meeting. away, weren't you? I was right away. Um, wow, did these volunteers love our city, the environment. Um, it was really nice. They're all both sets are working on our Earth Month in Bexley. It's not just a day. It's a month, all of April. Please, there's going to be lots going on, lots of exciting things going on, a lot of things that we can all participate in and drag our families along to participate in, and it'll be um, lots of fun. Um, uh, Bexley Tree and Garden say they have a tremendous committee working on what they're doing. Um, I wanted to um, mention that we need a new chair uh, for ESEC as Elizabeth has taken a position. Um, so uh, for all of those who are listening, um, 
if you are interested in becoming a member of ESAC, please, please, please uh, give the mayor um, notification. And um, I would urge all of you to take a look at a website, maybe you guys know it. It's um, powered by Husqvarna and it's um, called H-U-G-S-I, Hugsy. You can literally put Bexley's, Bexley in um, and see how it ranks next to other cities all over the globe in the tree canopy and green space. It's really, it's really an interesting, an interesting thing. And it will rate us, believe it or not, we, we beat all kinds of people, but we really only have a B minus <laughs> in green space, but it's really, really cool. We are on the map. <clears throat> but we beat Dublin and up Arlington, right? Yeah, but, but Charlotte's got us going. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Who do you guys want to compete with? How about do Dublin? How about, do Dublin. I, I do Dublin. <laughs> Upper Arlington. I don't, I, see, I don't think they've all gone through the whole. Oh, uh, look at that. See how much greener we are? Yay. Look, I saw it. A little more greener. <laughs> Isn't that really cool, though, that it does that? Look. Yay. Yay, we're the greener city. <laughs> <laughs> he's just doing he's doing cities that make him feel good. Anyway, I thought it was an interesting thing. <laughs> Do we have any Ohio cities, central Ohio cities? Madrid. Uh, I don't know. I think Columbus is actually. I think Columbus. No, 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 no. I heard they estimated Dublin and Upper Arlington and we beat them bad. No, Lima is there, but Unfortunately, that's Lima. That's Lima. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm learning a lot. I will bring you back what I learned. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Mr. Marcelino, do you have a report for the Safety and Health Committee? Very brief. Uh, for those of you that have not heard, uh, they're providing free COVID tests uh, at www.covidtest.gov. They'll be delivered by the U.S. Postal Service at the end of the month. It should take about seven to 12 days to be delivered. But if you haven't heard about them, please go ahead and order as it's not clear how available those are going to be um, in the future at other places. So good luck. That's all. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Klingler, Zoning and Development Committee. Nothing to report. Ms. Saad, Recreation and Parks Committee. The rink is open. And uh, for those who are looking to get over to the rink and they're not sure how, you just go to Bexley Park and Rec like you would for registration for any of the programming. And that is how you register to get on the ice. Um, I hope to see you out there. I'll be out there Thursday night. Um, maybe later Wednesday night um, and as much as possible while it is cold enough to have the rink up. So i um, getting a lot of texts from other people in the community excited to get out there. So I love that uh, this is happening again by the rec department. Um, the senior tour, as Monique mentioned, was great. We're super excited for our seniors. Um, I think they recently met last week over there for one of their um, outings and all went well as far as parking spaces and waiting on the Bexley beat to get them out and about. And so that's a major step forward um, for us. And then um, as Lori Ann said about openings, there is an opening for Bexley Park and Rec Board. And um, I am out talking about that because as we mentioned, Mr. McPeak has moved on to sit here. So I would love uh, another Mr. McPeak uh, to join us on Park and Rec Board. So please submit your applications. And that is it. That would be a good, ring, a good week for the ice rink. And what a great option, actually, to have here in the community for some activity. Ms. Robinson, Strategic Committee. I just have a couple quick things. First of all, my parents, thank you for adding the word curating to uh, my committee description. It's making that arts administration degree come in really handy. So thank you for shout noticing. out to yes. Connie and Dick Mormon. <laughs> Your money was well spent. Um, I do want to uh, just mention two things. Uh, CIC retreat is this Friday uh, from one to five. I know um, Ms. Lampke and Mr. Klingler and I will be attending that. Um, you look shocked. 
Oh, I mean, <laughs> these masks, that was a shocked look for a moment. Um, it will be at the, the soon to be new senior center. Uh, there also is a regular CIC meeting next Tuesday, um, six o'clock right here at um, council for anybody who would like to attend. And um, also to members of council, I'm gonna be working with um, our council president to put together our retreat. And I will be reaching out to you guys over the course of the next couple of weeks to talk about you know, your ideas for things we might want to cover during that time. Um, and I did reach out to Mike Price today to see if we might be able to actually hold our retreat at the Senior Center. Excellent. And we've been given the thumbs up, of course, pending dates and times to make sure that that works. But I'm excited to uh, sit on those new beautiful couches and maybe play a little ping pong. Don't believe the, the ping pong table up. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So uh, look for those. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, to get this retreat going. I think, especially with some, some new people um, on council and, and hopefully entering a more normal time, I'm excited to uh, kind of get us back together and, and talk about what we'd like to achieve over the next year. So um, email's coming. And other than that, I have nothing more. Thank you. We'll look forward to that. And then I would also encourage, I know you did here, but if you have ideas for the retreat, things you would like to learn about or know about or include, uh, please forward them to Ms. Robinson. Item 22 is public comment, no speaker slip required. If there are any comment questions from the uh, gallery? <laughs> if not, I will take a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Ms. Saad motions. Second. Second by Ms. Lamke. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed?